Thank you, Stephanie. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sakina Al Haddad. First time at LAC, so just thought to <laughs> um, introduce myself. I'm a lecturer uh, from Griffith University, that's in Brisbane, um, Australia. And today I'm talking on behalf of uh, really the collective team um, here. And I've been really privileged in being able to really bounce off and test ideas um, with very clever and nice people in this case, all of whom work in very uh, different domains of higher education. Um, just before I start, of course, things work when you turn it on. Okay. <laughs> no, maybe not even then. Hmm. Yeah, I'll just use my keyboard. So I won't be able to use a pointer. That's fine. There we go. Um, I'd just first um, like to take a minute to pay a special tribute to John Cassiopo. Um, he passed away uh, two days ago, and I think one of the things that I really wanted to highlight is that you know, he was very influential uh, for my work all the way from undergraduate uh, times, mainly because of his uh, work in methodology, or dedication methodology, um, and really thinking out of the box in terms of interdisciplinary practice. He started doing uh, work in uh, social psychology, but trying to merge that with biological psychology and cognitive psychology at a time where that was quite divided, right? And his persistence really started out an entire discipline called social neuroscience. And since then, we learned quite a bit because of his, you know, prioritizing the importance of understanding these complex mechanisms as connected. So I just wanted to share that. I just also found out um, yesterday as I read his uh, APS farewell letter, which was actually written in 2008, and I just haven't seen it till now, is that, um, so in, in second year, I had this letter from Ivan Pavlov that he wrote to his students uh, before he passed, and I had that since second year of undergrad. So I've had that on my wall all the way now till I'm you know, in faculty and found that he was also influenced by that. And so that idea of you know, as scientists and educators, our work and words may have reached beyond you know, where we may never know, essentially, that's it. Okay. Taking some time for that? No. Um, this talk, I'd like to focus today on just the reconceptualization part, not so much the call for research. And as I go through the reconceptualization part, I just want to encourage you to perhaps reflect and think about your own questions and what it might you know, uh, be things that you're interested in that's related to this, uh, and perhaps consider how these might be operationalized in your research or what it means for practice, for instance. So first, just to say that um, this uh, prefacing of teaching is designed with analytics enabled is not to say that teaching is designed has to be analytics enabled, um, because you know, one, I believe that uh, in, in it, not sort of imposing a particular approach, but rather educating uh, so that one is able to make independent critical judgments about that practice. But the prefacing is intentional in, and in the precision of understanding teaching as design where analytics is integrated in practice. So the impetus is really that, right? Because introducing analytics into teaching as design in particular does introduce unique challenges and just sort of working towards ways of understanding uh, that as a connected, uh, infused practice, so to speak. And uh, going with the conference theme of uh, user-centered design, I'd really like to focus on the human element and, and what it might mean when we consider uh, the human element in complex practice, such as uh, designing for learning. And throughout the conference, we've talked about multiple bridges. This is Sydney Harbour Bridge in 1930, by the way. Um, that you know, we know that as a field le learning analytics uh, aims to bridge across disciplines, across methodologies, across people. And one that I'd like to draw attention to today is the research and practice bridge. And keeping that human element uh, as the focus, then we can view this as, on the one hand, we want research-informed practitioners. And on the other hand, we also want to use inspired research, right? So practitioner-informed researchers. And so our call uh, for research is this specific type of research to understand uh, practice so as to inform development of tools, systems, processes to enhance practice, but also you know, that research is grounded in, in practice to affect practice. And so what are our 
consideration of these uh, pragmatic uh, methodologies to research these. And in higher education in particular, you know, many of us are situated right at the nexus, right? So we're both researchers and practitioners. Uh, and that's quite unique, I think, uh, uh, in, in research. research. Uh, anyway, you know what I mean. All right, moving on. <laughs> and so in the talk, the human in focus here are teachers. And we do adopt an inclusive view of teachers. That is, we use the teachers to represent educators in all sectors. Uh, and professions, uh, but for the purposes of this talk, I've contextualized it for higher education. And particularly in order to understand the real world challenges of progressing, you know, teachers' efficacy, agency, uh, and capacity towards analytics enabled teaching as design, that we really have to understand these processes as situated uh, in the social and cultural contexts where even where teachers are, you know, recognized as cognitive, social, and emotional beings, all of that are situated within an external um, frame. Now to frame this, I'd like to try this quick activity with you, so a quick experiment, right? I'm gonna show you two pictures of masks. And when you see them, I'd like you to identify whether the mask appears hollow or full. All right, so is this mask hollow or full? Hollow? Full? Yep. So more saying full, less hollow. What about this one? Full? Concave. Oh, yeah, sorry, no, sorry, uh, hollow. <laughs> Use the wrong word. Okay, now even more people are saying that it's full. But by and large, mostly for both of the masks, we view them as uh, full. Now, this is actually a classic experiment from 1997 by the late Richard Gregory. And this effect is actually called the uh, hollow face effect. Now, the idea is that even though the back of the mask is actually truly concave, it appears convex in the brain, right? Because the brain is reconstructing the hollow face to represent a normal face. And so this is theorized that, you know, the, the amounts, amounts, <laughs> put two words together, the immense amount of knowledge that we have about faces that we expect noses to be protruding and so on actually overrides all of the monocular depth cues that you do have in visual perception at such a very low level where even at a low level of just seeing things visually, it can be shaped by our cognitive heuristics of what we know, right? Now, I'm going to use this as an analogy rather than an actual um, basis of understanding of the processes because what we uh, understand in teacher practice is complex cognition, right? So we do, uh, I think Christina Canati yesterday talked about some of the uh, applications of these kinds of uh, research evidence in understanding how we allocate attention, making decisions, attribute meanings in our world, and so on and so forth. We know that they are impermeable, they're not impermeable to our experiences, our values, and uh, principles, for instance. So in teaching as design, we're looking at complex cognition. And so what we want to understand is how that might operate within the confluence of the within person factors as situated in varying social and cultural contexts. And so, you know, we know that uh, this is what we see a lot. So in learning analytics, one of the prevailing approach, and you know, of course it's a very smart one, that is if we want to use learning analytics to, uh, in, in educational practice, then we should be linking it with design for learning. There's some connection there, and that the key to meaning making with learning analytics is via the design for learning, and that this relationship is bi-directional. So there's a lot of work in that uh, so far, there's a lot of good work in that so far, and also good work in trying to understand this from the teacher inquiry perspective. There's also a lot of good work in understanding the analysis of learning analytics as contextualized in learning design, and an example of this is the paper that won best paper at this conference, congrats for that. Um, and so thus far, there's also been really clever designs of tools that are explicitly aligned to uh, learning design, where learning analytics is concerned. A loop tool is an example, for example, and uh, learning design studio, for instance, is another one. You can Google these to find out more about that. But essentially, uh, these prior examples are really great in helping us understand the process of doing in design, right? And our reconceptualization here of teaching as design is that teaching as design is bigger than the doing, right? It is the way of thinking, it is the way of knowing as much as uh, a way of doing. And so for us, 
that focus on teacher at the center um, within teaching as design perhaps might be useful in further understanding the teacher processes in that, um, in that work. Uh, and so inherently we know that teaching does involve design, often we use some frameworks to guide this, but uh, today I won't be talking about tools, and the large focus is, as I say, about processes, but what uh, I think is important to note is that teaching as design is a mindset uh, in as much as a process of doing and knowing and so on and so forth. Um, and that there is a fundamental intentionality element to it in design thinking with particular um, attention to educational complexity. I won't go into too much detail about teaching as design in and of itself. The paper has the details. And um, also, teaching as design, of course, is not new. Sarah Denham wrote about this, I think, as early as 1989. Um, and I think... Uh, now, I consider this a seminal piece. It was only in 2015, but still. Peter Goodyear wrote a, a brilliant uh, review of teaching as design. I highly recommend reading this paper. And he actually proposes this as a key approach towards uh, sustainability in higher education, in, you know, particularly in times of increased pressures in higher education. And so if we recall that research praxis uh, Research practice, research practice nexus, Venn diagram, uh, particularly for us in the middle, you find that we already do engage in some of the uh, elements of teaching as design. But what's interesting is how um, knowing that we do engage in that, so that metacognition about uh, us engaging in this particular activity, um, as much as sort of development of personal ontologies and epistemologies about learning and teaching, and how that sort of develops over time would be interesting to, I think, think about as we go forward. And so why particularly the prefacing of analytics enable teaching is design, and I kind of uh, alluded to the, the importance of the precision there, but the other is that um, we're proposing that this precisely allows us to focus on better understanding uh, the teacher as the, the cognitive, social, and emotional being. And so we're proposing that the reconceptualization as such has multiple benefits uh, for one, affecting teacher development, fusing of new practices, and also uh, of institutional strategy for learning analytics. So one is that as this, uh, with this conceptualization, it conceptualizes the practice as part of the teacher developing identity, or the construct, oh, that didn't come out, the, the construct itself, that's fine. Um, so rather than just the practice and what the teacher does, it shifts the focus from constructions of tools and structured steps to that of underlying processes of ways of thinking and knowing. Um, the other is that it, it aligns well, of course, with the need for, you know, reconceptualization of time in teaching as design, uh, in that the increased availability, more readily uh, available data over time, can really facilitate that normalizing of design as something that is done, thought about, understood in simply the regular passage of time. So that you know you can really start uh, anywhere. So a, a more flexible way of thinking about design cycles, for instance. Um, third, we propose that conceptualizing teaching as design uh, that it really um, is not a new practice, but rather it encourages the acknowledgement of existing expertise and existing practice. And it's more about the broadening or grafting with uh, existing practice. And as such, uh, you know, it, it really forces us to understand existing practice in as much as the development of, of the practice in, in interrogating and analyzing complex educational problems. Um, fourth is that we propose viewing this uh, as uh, teaching as design supports that shift in thinking from consideration of scalability in um, large numbers, that is, we need to scale this up with one solution, as opposed to thinking about scality, uh, scality, scalability in combined numbers, right? So via collective on uh, mass uh, approach. So it's really a shift in thinking about what scalability means in uh, strategies. And finally, conceptualizing teaching as design provides an avenue for research that really helps us understand uh, the learning ecology and the role of teaching in you know, very complex learning environments that includes learning analytics, but not uh, just specific to learning analytics. 
And so as such, this really allows us to reevaluate and rethink what it means to uh, integrate inquiry and evaluation, or design thinking in teaching practice. What does that really mean? And so it's almost like, yeah, it comes with a lot of challenges, but it's a blessing in disguise, right? It actually allows us to really look deeply in our, uh, at our practice because there is this new thing that's coming, uh, so to speak. Okay, so a lot of these, are, um, I've got some questions here that I think if you can take forward with you, I suppose, sort of like, as I go through some of the key considerations, you know, what does, what does understanding actually mean in some of these key factors? Uh, what are the questions that you would uh, want to ask yourselves, and how would understanding these factors help design for, say, professional learning uh, systems or strategies better? And a lot of these are as much about understanding existing practice as uh, the, the development of it. And so our proposal is that to consider the key factors that, the, you know, for effective connection between design for learning and learning analytics, it is really mediated through the teacher uh, processes, and these processes are cognitive, it's, so, it's social, emotional, it is uh, sort of core to identity, and so on and so forth. Now, this is of course situated uh, within the social and cultural contextual factors, and you know, sim something that might seem really simple, um, like what we call certain things, language, for example, like the term of using. Uh, whoops, okay, here we go. Um, but using terms like adoption, for instance, right? Um, how does a simple use of a term shape the confluence of that downstream and upstream effects in how it impacts on the teacher uh, with those particular factors, right? So by using that term, for instance, how do that shape the values uh, that comes with it and as such the processes and outcomes that we not only look to affect, um, but also how we think about what impact is. I've forgotten what I was going to say, so I'll just move on to the next one. Um, and so, yes, uh, and you know, all of that confluence of the within person and external uh, factors, of course, are multitude, multidimensional, but they do shape what we end up placing values on. And to always consider that when we examine uh, teacher practice with learning analytics. So, for uh, key f considerations were the ones that we identified. Um, I'm going to go through very briefly all of these. So one is uh, teachers' beliefs and uh, situated. Well, all of these are situated. I don't know why I said situated. Just in that one, all of it situated. <laughs> okay. Um, so teacher beliefs about learning and teaching we know is uh, tied to their conceptions of learning and teaching. Uh, same thing with educational technology, and really it would be the same for uh, learning analytics as well, right? So what are their conceptions about uh, learning analytics that would uh, impact on how they would perceive their relative identity to that practice, for instance, and how that might shift over time based on what uh, they do in future, because identity is not a static thing. Yep. Um, and so. The idea is that we want to think about teacher beliefs and identity as the construct itself, where we do have to recognize the past, of course. So we have to understand that, the present, and also the construction uh, of the self in future. And what does this mean as, say, uh, the person develops personal epistemologies about, say, um, ethical practice of learning analytics, kind of pointing to the last presentation for today. Looking forward to that one. Um, so. Next is cognition, and we know that designing for learning is, of course, a cognitively, emotionally, socially demanding task. Um, I've kind of we've separated socio-emotional and cognition, but really everything is cognitive. We can argue, right? It's just situated cognition. Okay, um, and so cognition is a massive one, of course, and we've done a lot of work in this, in not me personally, but as a field, um, in uh, teaching as design, understanding uh, design cognition, you know, what's actionable knowledge, what is knowledgeable action. It's a lot of work coming out of Peter Goodyear's lab as well uh, in that regard. So what, what are the, um, what becomes actionable knowledge uh, in teaching as design? So not only for understanding that, but also the knowledge for um, design, planning for evaluation and assessment, right? So, yep. Um, so how do the external pressures, uh, as we talked about, like values and all of that impact on uh, the planning of what to actually analyze, what to evaluate, but also the inferences made, reasoning and proposed actions and so on and so forth. 
Um, it's those two emotional factors, we know they underpin uh, the affective and relational aspects of teaching as design in particular, and they're really em embodied in uh, the design work, right? And some of these come across as biases, heuristics, and of course, ethical practice. And some are implicit, some are explicit. And of course, the importance of understanding these uh, cannot be understated, of course, particularly in the context of learning analytics, because it's not just uh, talking about use of data per se, but also in terms of uh, algorithmic uh, accountability and so on and so forth. So how do we understand these processes as a situated uh, and complex uh, interaction of factors? Uh, I won't say much about ethics. I think there's a lot that's been said about this one, but personally, I think, personally, I just saw the word personal, and so I said personally. Um, but one of the interesting things um, that we might think about as moving forward is that as we develop, uh, you know, ways of thinking about ethics, which of course is beyond uh, privacy and so on and so forth, how do we understand the development of personal epistemologies, uh, beliefs about uh, ethical teaching as design practice as we go along? And again, I'll point you to the paper for that one. Um, and uh, finally, team teaching as design. We know that in the field of design, including educational design, the focus really has shifted from the individual to the collective team. Uh, in which, you know, there's complementary skills often brought together working towards similar goal. And so this really touches on some of the challenges in the field in terms of interdisciplinarity, right? But this is also uh, distributed cognition in very specific ways. So we need to understand um, what that means in a situated context of teaching as design and specifically over iterations. How does that develop over time? And of course, in context, I won't go through this one in detail. There's some other papers that sort of touches on that as well, if you're interested uh, to read further. And so um, the proposal is really about, yep, yeah, it's, it's really important for us to understand each of those factors in isolation, but also in uh, the, the complex assemblage that they are, right? So that each of these factors uh, influence each other during analytics-enabled teaching as design. So in separating it, it might help us understand uh, each of these mechanistically a bit deeper, but then we also want to understand it in the complexity of uh, its connection uh, itself. And um, for, for those who are involved in strategy of learning analytics, this is something to keep in mind as well uh, in sort of uh, keeping in mind a long view of that, so to help manage expectations of what the developmental process is realistically like. It's not a simple practice of um, just give them data and they can do that. And of course, all of us understand that, but it's about communicating that to those who are outside of uh, the field. And I think importantly as well is thinking about developing that culture of support so that we can keep on that developmental uh, trajectory in mind. So I'll end there. I've kept these questions out in case that would link to any questions. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, that's, that's a really tricky one. <laughs> um, but one that I think I, I, f I face that uh, a lot in, in some of the work that I do um, in various places. Um, and um, in recognizing the, the teacher as, as I say, the, a socio-emotional being in as much as cognitive being, um, often 
the approaches that um, kind of structures prescriptive directions as to this is good, which inherently comes with implicit messages that actually what you're doing is really bad and you need to do this. Not good enough. Yeah, right? Um, <laughs> um, often is more difficult to sort of keep them on path and to uh, almost catalyze uh, the, the openness to trying something new. And um, I have found that the approaches uh, that respects the existing practices and existing knowledge, and then trying to fuse some of these practices, so getting them to think actively about, um, of course, thinking is active, anyway, uh, think about um, what this might mean for them in their own context. So in the existing practice, if you do this, then you know, what are, those, what are some of the new questions that you might have and so on and so forth. And that process of uh, critical inquiry in trying to graft it uh, appears to kind of keep them on board long enough so that then they're able to try and give, a, give it a go and understand that, yeah, it takes longer, but then it means that they're still with you and they're learning about it. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sagna. Um, I, I totally agree with uh, using teaching as a sign, as a paradigm to understand teaching. Uh, but I had a question, and that's a question, very broad question for uh, uh, teaching as a sign is if the mindset that we want to promote, uh, how are we going to convince teachers to think as designers? And uh, in its connection with learning analytics as well as a design. Uh, uh, as a design practice, even not all of us here think as that learning analytics is a design practice. So what, do you have any thought about how to convince teachers to shift to this mindset of, of that they, are, they can consider themselves as designers? Yeah, I, I, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I don't see it as convincing as much as uh, facilitating metacognitive awareness that they are already engaging in that on some level, right? So it's, it's one of those things, much like our learners sometimes engage in uh, quite adaptive practices, but they might not be aware that they are engaging in those practices. And bringing to light these are the processes that you have been engaging in, uh, engaging in um, I think is that it's a stronger uh, relational approach to get him, getting them to, one, understand that they are already doing that, right? Which means that this is not actually something new, but once you know that you're already engaging in that, how do you get them to become more interested in understanding that more deeply? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so, so from a, uh, let's say a more change management uh, perspective, how, in, uh, in how far do you think organizations are ready and teachers are ready for this analytics enabled uh, teaching as design approach? Because in, in my practice, I've had many dis uh, discussions with teaching staff where they feel that they either really did well teaching their course or the exact opposite. And then the numbers uh, paint a completely different uh, picture and trying to, let's say, merge those two images into uh, one resonating idea that allows the teacher to improve his course is occasionally very difficult. Yeah, um, it takes a lot of patience, doesn't it? <laughs> it's much like when, um, as, as a teacher, you, you've designed some uh, you know, activities, for instance, for learners, you know that it's gonna be extremely difficult for them and they're gonna struggle through it, but you know you have the long view and you understand that if if you're able to design it in a way that at least keeps them engaged long enough that that metacognitive awareness will come, I have no answer for that. But it's really about how can we perhaps consider approaches that um, recognizes authentic practice, but at the same time, uh, perhaps educating ways of enhancing their critical inquiry about their own practice, right? That is 
relate it to the literature, then they can read more about it in that specific ways and stuff like that. I think that's really important because we talk about scholarly practice for design for learning, but not so much scholarly practice for professional learning. And I think that's an important part of the loop as well in considering the teachers at the center of this. Um, I just want to add as well, like, you know, um, just relatable, like we having that design mindset, um, you know, it's like we're selling properties, um, you know, everyone wants to try and design and make this property sellable, um, then you actually um, basically approach an interior designer, but then you're get, getting all the shows, you're seeing all the shows, like the blocks and things, and then you educate yourself, it's, it's more of that awareness that they can actually do it as well and you keep practicing. That, that's how I see it as how do we actually um, encourage that design mindset. You know? So it's so. not a one-shot, bring it in and show them something. Sometimes, you know, you, you, when you're new to that area, you do need, it takes practice, sure. you know, and so you actually, so um, organization like this, you learn more. So I, I come from that, you know, my, learn, my own learning journey in the analytics. I did not know much about analytics. It's more about the organization analytics, but coming more, uh, okay, I'm be becoming more aware about, you know, behind those data, they're human beings. So, yeah. yeah.